Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Francis Steed Sellers, a senior writer at the Washington Post. My first guest this morning is the co-founder and CEO of a plastics recycling company, Bioselection. Miranda Wang, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you, Francis. Well, we're delighted to have you. So from what I've read, um, this all started with an 11th grade trip to a refuse center, but tell me what prompted you to start Bioselection and what the company actually is. Sure. Um, so when I was a teenager, um, I had this opportunity to visit a waste transfer station uh, while I was growing up in Vancouver, Canada. And it just dawned on both me and my co-founder, who's my high school best friend, that um, you know we have this huge problem. Um, few people know what happens to their plastic, to their trash in general, and their recycling after they leave it out at the curbside. But actually, um, globally, only 9% of plastics that we produce every year is getting recycled. And of that 9%, very little of it, even less of it, is actually getting effectively recycled. Um, and so while most of us might think that recycling starts and ends with putting things in a recycling bin, that's actually not true. And um, the problem is that uh, when we talk about plastics, we make it sound like it's just one material, but in reality, it's a class of multiple types of materials. Um, it's actually, you know, a whole world of, of lots of different mixed materials. And uh, right now, you know, for a lot of plastics that we most ubiquitously use, such as low density polyethylene, which is, you know, what we would use for a plastic bag, for example, materials like that are very hard to recycle just due to the chemical nature of that material is part of why it's so cheap to produce that material at scale because of its chemical structure but it's also because um, but also because of this chemical structure it's really difficult to recycle it and so what my company does is we are creating a circular economy solution for these types of plastics that are very hard to recycle. And we do it by using an innovative technology we've invented to chemically break down this plastic, not into fuels, but into chemical building blocks that can then be used to uh, whether to be turned into uh, performance materials that can be reintroduced back into the economy, into products like shoes and cars and apparel, um, but also um, into a variety of other kinds of products through technologies like bio technology um, and so we're creating you know a chemical solution for for a relatively complex real world problem so you're really talking about taking the plastic bags i throw out every day and turning them into useful objects shoes apparel and other things tell me why this you, you've said this is a really dire and urgent problem at the moment what's the the biggest message you would like to get over to the general public and how are you doing it yeah, I think I think as an everyday person, you know, the technologies that are in development is not just our company. There are other companies doing this too in different ways. Um, you know, the com the tech the solutions are in incubation. They're being scaled up, but um, our solutions are not yet at a level that can handle all the problems, the scale of the plastic problem we have available around the world. And so as an everyday person, what you can do to you know, ease in the, the pain here um, is to really be conscious about the plastics you're using. Um, you know, every day it seems impossible to be getting any goods uh, that comes into your home without packaging, you know, plastic packaging around it. But um, for us to make the conscious choice and to give the feedback to the merchants and the retailers that this is, you know, constantly pushed back, that this is not something, you know, we can continue uh, consuming at, in this type of volume. We have to work on reducing our footprint and not treating the use of plastics and the discardment of plastics as if it's something that is that is free, that is that is unlimited, because um, you know, the solutions are not yet at the scales that are needed and we're quickly scaling them up. Um, but, you know, in times like COVID, uh, for all manufacturing type technologies, you know, there is a setback. There is There are challenges to scaling up these types of technologies and society needs to be aware of, you know, how there's a mismatch between the volumes out there and, and the, the amount that technologies can handle still. Miranda, Take that point a little bit further. How has the pandemic made this more of a challenge? So the pandemic has really taken a lot of energy out at a time when I would say the world, the economy is least prepared for it. Um, but in a way, you know, we, we came off after, especially in the United States, a decade of 
uh, positive economic growth. Um, so you can kind of argue either way. Of course, it's you know something that took out a lot of financial resources, a lot of time, um, you know, caused a lot of exhaustion, but has created new opportunity and has forced us to look at how do we move into this new decade. Uh, you know, doing the right things that we have to do. We have a lot of kind of backlogged uh, work that we need to do for our society. Uh, we can't accelerate the society and our technology development asymmetrically, focusing only on things that, you know, are, uh, you know, for, you know, first world problems or for making, making life more comfortable and enjoyable. We have to catch up on things that would make, you know, our environment uh, something that that we can actually have in the future, that we can pass on to future generations. We have all sorts of critical issues right now that um, you know we don't have enough young people working um, in these fields, or just just people, scientists, inventors, business people working in them in general. Um, you know we need to fill those voids, and we need the financial resources to be there, the policies to be there to accelerate those solutions. So tell me what role you think government should be playing. Some governments have banned single-use plastics. What would you like to see here? You talked about your Canadian background. You now live in the US. What should the US government be doing? It's a challenging one for the governments because the technology solutions are emerging, but they're not fully at scale yet. And so for, for policy, you know, it's easy to say, let's just stick with bans. I mean, I think from policy standpoint, there are not that, that many tools right now in their tool chest as, as they would will have in a decade from now. And so I think policy is important for policy to continuously keep up with what the technologies are, with understanding and assessing how these new technologies uh, should be implemented and, and constantly update, updating every single year to make sure that we're implementing the, the best plan that we can, um, you know, as as things change and and also understanding the complexity of this plastic problem right it's not a black or white problem it's not that we're either pro plastics or against plastics plastics are a hu human made material that is the best invention really of the of the last century of this century is the material that's really enabled a lot of people to be able to get clean food to get you know the quality of life that we have um, and so it's not a, a fight against plastics. It's necessary, you know. It's it's more about how do we how do we ensure that we're all able to live well in this modern age, um, and and sustain this kind of you know the like kind of lifestyle style we have without destroying our planet. How do we use this material plastics and redesign it? How do we um, how do we create this material while thinking about what happens to it after it's used? Um, I think we're definitely capable of doing this. It's just that it's, you know, for, for anything like anything like these problems, it takes some time um, for the solutions to be invented and to be scaled up. And, and we just have to not lose hope and we need to continue focusing on solving these problems until they're solved. Miranda, we've been hearing from our audience and I'd like to read you one of the questions that's come in this morning. This is from Layla Hawkins, who lives in California, and she asks, do you think colleges should be training students for careers in climate solutions? Absolutely. Um, I mean, 2020 is a decade for humans to really reflect on, uh, you know, what does our future look like? Where do we stand and where does our future look like? And I think we're forced to have to do that. And I think it's, you know, once you think on that problem, um, it's inevitable. You come to, you know, these, these huge issues that have been kind of swept under the rug. And climate change has become this, you know, politicized, huge, complex issue. But really, when you start chipping away at it, there are definitely concrete issues, concrete problems that we can start knocking out to simplify the problem and to make it, you know, significantly better. And what we need, first of all, are people who will work on these problems. And education is, you know, the key to opening that up. So, um, absolutely, I think in this in this era, if you want to learn something that you know, will be relevant to society, will make your skills valuable in a workforce, you know, that that is a, a must have. You, you have to know how to join this fight. So you've been talking to me about the plastics that I throw out in my recycle, or put into my recycling bin and hope don't get thrown out. What about the plastic that's already broken down in the sea, for example, and polluting in very small particles, um, our oceans? Yeah, so 
what happens when plastics get out into the oceans is that they actually pass through an oxidation pathway um, that's been well studied for decades. Uh, usually what you read about in you know sources like National Geographic or other kinds of news sources is that you know we get this huge amount of microplastics in the ocean and that's the problem is that you know plastics start to really fray and decay and become little bits and bits but eventually after hundreds of years you know these microplastics they do end up breaking down into biodegradable chemicals and from there being ingested by bacteria and organisms that are that are in the ecosystem it's just that that period is extremely prolonged and so you have these partially broken down plastics in the environment getting contaminated you know getting contaminating into our food streams um, and and that's what's causing all of these problems and that's why it's dangerous um, the thing is that you know animals in the in the environment organisms you know they don't live for hundreds of years <laughs> they can't tolerate that um, so we we really have to keep plastics out of the environment we have to figure out how do we responsibly use this material that we've invented um, and doesn't break down you know very readily in the environment um, and since it's already produced at huge scales how do we close the loop um, I think that's from an industry perspective, that's the first thing we have to do. And then we need to go in and assess, you know, have we over engineered this material? Um, have we created too many types of plastics that don't need to be here? Have we, um, for example, always prioritized things like color and surface finishings and making the plastics fancy and nice to touch over the practicality of it being of it being recycled at the end of use? Right. We, we have to choose a society. You can't have it all. You can't have the beautiful products that are on the shelves um, and having 50 different kinds of it at any given time and having amazing recyclability and sustainability. We, we just have to pick a lot of the things. I think people don't, wouldn't even know that that kind of luxury that we have is at a huge expense of sustainability. Miranda, I think I have time for one last question, and it's a kind of big one, but um... You've been working on plastics recycling. Do you see that for the being the, the quest for the rest of your life? Or is there another environmental challenge that you will be working on in the future? You know, I think it's hard to find a problem as big as working on, you know, the plastic pollution problem, which is so it's not just on the surface, you know, materials in the environment creating pollution, but it's tied into the carbon problem um, directly with climate change. Um, it's tied in with with social justice, um, you know, because people who are living near and affected by plastic pollution are usually the, the most poor in the world. Um, and so it's it's a very meaningful problem to be working on. And I think I'll be working on it for a very long time. Miranda Wang, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, we were delighted. I'll be back soon after a short video to talk about two other young leaders in this world of environmental challenges, Sarah Evans and Curran J. Ruth. I look forward to seeing you again after the video. I shouldn't have to be doing this. I should be a quote unquote normal kid uh, being, going to school and not having to worry about this, but the government has left us no choice. Welcome back to Washington Post Live. If you're just joining us, I'm Francis Steed Sellers, a senior writer at the Washington Post. I'm delighted now to introduce two young leaders in the environmental world, Sarah Evans, the founder, co-founder of Well Aware, and Curran Jeru, who's an inventor, entrepreneur, and more. Welcome to you both. Thank you for having us. And just checking we can hear you, Sarah, too. Yes, yes, thank you for having me. Delighted to have you both here. So Sarah, let's talk to you about well Aware. Can you tell me a little bit about how you founded the company and also about the complementary company Well Beyond that you've worked with, which is a consulting company? Certainly, yes. I founded Well Aware about 12 years ago. 
it was not my background. I went to law school and have a legal background, but I was uh, asked to join a project in Kenya to fund the replacement of some livestock in this village because of the drought. But the more I researched the issue uh, and dug into the problem and started to get some to know some of the community members, I realized that the core issue was a lack of clean water there. So we switched the project to raise money for a water well instead. And the, the first project was um, um, exciting uh, and exhilarating, and I knew nothing about what I was doing. <laughs> we got really lucky, and the water well uh, it was successful and high yielding. Is still benefiting that community. So I really fell in love with the work and I fell in love with the, the region, uh, but I also saw that there were really big issues with the way that water system infrastructure was being put into, not just rural places in Kenya, but developing regions all over the world. Most of the water wells that are put in, in Africa actually don't work um, about a year after they're installed, and that's a big issue. And there are so many resources being put into uh, solving um, the global water issues, but they're not really being directed toward effective solutions. So we built well aware around studying the failure and understanding how things go wrong. And really the, the, the biggest two issues are the lack of technical expertise and the lack of true community partnership and, and understanding communities before you go in and offer a solution because they're the ones who know the solution and we only plug in the resources that they lack. And that's typically the expertise and some funding. So well aware began to grow um, and build capacity. And we knew we could continue to scale, but I started to feel like we I could probably tackle this bigger issue of all the resources being put into the water sector that really were not, not only not benefiting the community, but actually a big disservice to communities because they changed their lifestyles and they put in their resources around a new clean new source of water, and then it goes away and it's further devastating for these regions. And that's the inspiration for the formation of the new company, Well Beyond, which began consulting for other NGOs around their clean water infrastructure implementation. And now we're developing technology to leverage the technology that's already rapidly evolving in these regions to further support these communities and put the power and the knowledge and the education in their hands to manage their own water. Sarah, thank you. Karen, Sarah was inspired by a trip overseas, but the disaster that came to your attention was right on your doorstep. Tell us about what prompted you to get involved in this environmental work. Absolutely. So this was the Deepwater Horizon spill, which happened in 2010. And my family and I moved from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia in 2008. And essentially just seeing the devastation in our backyard, the Gulf of Mexico, because we live around 30 minutes from there, really sparked my interest in trying to solve solutions that could have a global impact. At that time, I was in high school. I didn't have a college degree. And so what my limiting factors were, were just not having resources. And so what I decided to do was use Science Fair as a way to be able to engage in these types of solutions. And freshman year of high school, I got involved with the science fair, um, talked to one of my teachers who happened to have contacts within the oil and gas industry. And that ultimately then allowed me to use software and simulations to develop this solution. But what really sparked my interest in this was just seeing this devastation over the course of three months not come to a standstill. As you can imagine, the news headlines were all over, not only with our local community, but around the world. And after seeing all the solutions that were developed, that really sparked my interest in thinking if, if I could do something, regardless of the scale, and regardless of if it even worked, me actually contributing and making an attempt would be, would be something that I would, that I would want to do. And so over the course of two years within the Science for program, I developed this device for cleaning up oil spills. What I saw the Deepwater Horizon solutions being were all centered around stopping the spill, which ultimately had them you know, need to think of those permanent solutions. But in my mind, the solution was, what if we temporarily stopped the spill? the spill would still be leaking but there would be some sort of capping mechanism that would allow for more time and more research to be placed to then ultimately think of a permanent solution and so my solution ultimately was a, a capping device that used temperature sensor and density 
um, sensors to ultimately monitor the oil and gas coming in and separate them into homogeneous phases to then be recycled. Sarah, you chose to start a nonprofit and then this consulting branch, but can you talk to me a little bit more about the roles nonprofits can can play and how they can scale up and deal with these enormous problems? I will. Um, and the, the nonprofit sector uh, has, a, has a big role to play in conjunction with the private sector and governments. Uh, what I, one of the other things I realized being, having been in the nonprofit international development world for about a decade is that the NGO uh, industry alone will not solve these issues. However, I think once we start working together a little bit more and sharing information and data, we can reduce some of the redundancy that you, we are seeing um, in the sector. A lot of times we go into the field to implement a new system or actually rehabilitate a system. And we're finding that there have been several NGOs in and out um, without knowledge of each other and with no way for these communities to get back in touch with the NGOs. That's one of the inspirations for developing this new technology, a smartphone app, to connect beneficiaries with their funders and regional offices so that we don't just go in and put something in and leave and never be heard from again. So, and I really do think that nonprofits um, can support each other in, in helping to maintain that contact and to help help each other measure results over time and not just consider a project complete after it's been implemented. So it's a long-term monitoring, sharing of information and collaboration within nonprofits that I think uh, will really have an impact on tackling the global water crisis. Thank you. And current. Well, you mentioned earlier on the importance of the science fair for you, but can you talk a little bit more about education and where science fairs fit in training young people to be able to take on these sorts of challenges? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the power of the science fairs is that it allows youth to come together and essentially solve any problem that they feel are ones that they that they need to solve, specifically solve problems in their backyards. And so the importance of science fair is ultimately that outlet to allow for creativity to be to be you know tackled or creative solutions to then be tackled and ultimately i think that the power of youth in participating in science fairs what, where it comes in is that we don't have the limitations in how we solve problems because we're not burdened with these barriers that industry individuals place on themselves with how problems are solved we ultimately have I believe this massive creative outlet that science fairs allow for solving these problems. So I'd like to ask, we've had some, been hearing from the audience, Sarah, I have a question for you, which I'm going to read out now. It is from Chris in California, who says, what indicators for climate change have not had enough attention and which ones are being overemphasized? That's a very, very good question. As it specifically relates uh, to water, I'm, I'm, I'm so in the weeds in this sector, I'm not really sure um, what's being um, overlooked uh, by the masses, uh, but I think it's pretty common knowledge that we're looking at aqu aquifer recharge issues that has a lot to do uh, with climate change and the lack of snow cover um, in uh, local geography. That is an issue for groundwater. It's also an issue uh, for surface water. Of course, um, as Miranda expressed, these issues always affect uh, the, mo the most impoverished most, as well as women. In these rural developing regions, once there's conflict over water, it is the women who are not prioritized for access um, and to use the water uh, for their own uh, commerce and needs, uh, unfortunately. Another issue, though, that we're, we're seeing in these regions um, that is, is, is not talked about much is the drastic change and fluctuation between droughts and floods, which we have not seen in recent years. So the groundwater is changing based on these variable climates, which are often already var variable in these regions. So the, the dramatic change between a drought and a flood will actually affect the groundwater. So we're seeing more turbid water underneath the surface, especially in the deeper aquifers. Um, and that's problematic, not just for water quality, but also for the equipment that's down hole if you're pumping water out of the ground. It's compromising that equipment. Um, it's making it more costly to have to, to be able to rehab and install these systems. So um, if, if it gets much worse, it's going to be incredibly problematic. So 
I'm hopeful that these amazing young people are going to help us address these issues and the awareness of these issues. And a quick follow up on that, because many of the problems you describe, we have documented as well in the United States and your focus is overseas. Do you see yourself bringing these technologies back to work in areas like the Texas border, the Navajo Nation, other areas where there's very poor water quality or lack of access to clean water? We get that question a lot. And we, we, we have actually done a little bit of disaster response work in, in Texas after uh, hurricanes. The, the problem in the US, um, of course, is, is politics and policy. Um, it, it's, you know, we have this uh, really niche expertise in, in groundwater and, and cultural understanding. Uh, in the United States, that's a lot trickier. Um, there's a lot more a lot more red tape to get through. However, I, I think with the new uh, innovations we're working on right now, it can be translated anywhere in the world. So we are actually hopeful that we can start working on the border or on the reservations and provide solutions at home as well as overseas. Thank you, Karen. Amnesty International recently had a survey that suggested that Generation Z has been more affected and is more uh, upset about climate change than prior generations. Why, Karen, are these issues resonating so much with young people now? Because this is our problem. This is ultimately a problem that we have inherited, that we, I think youth, especially in this day and age, are realizing that our leaders, if they're not going to solve it for us, we have to be the ones to take this initiative and solve it ourselves. Quite frankly, in today's day and age, climate change is the biggest threat to national security. But the thing is, it doesn't just go, it, it's not just national security for the United States, but it's international security. And I think the United States needs to take a multilateral approach and can't approach this in isolation. And that's what youth are kind of seeing right now, is that because climate change does not affect who we, um, who it, because climate change does not choose who it affects, it affects everyone. And unless we are the generation that brings this to light, it, it's not going to be, it's not going to be solved. And I think ultimately youth are, we're seeing, especially in today's day and age, youth organizing, inventing, and speaking up for what we believe in, because we're trying to show that our voice matters in this stage. We're being creative, resilient, we care, and we've been showing that we care because we ultimately are trying to have a seat at this decision-making table that affects our future and the generations to come. So Karen, how exactly is it a threat to national security? Where does the national security impact come in? I think a lot of that comes in with infrastructure. We're seeing the wildfires in, in California impacting infrastructure and power and ultimately impacting the community there. We're seeing storms and hurricanes in the Gulf Coast impacting global economy and infrastructure and ultimately this is this is truly where i think that national security angle comes in and that if we're not addressing this problem early on and being proactive rather than reactive we're going to see the way in which we live be affected and i think that's something that as more you know as we're as more devastation occurs we're going to truly then we don't want it to you know impact us then and only then realize what we've done and what we've what we could have solved, but yeah, I think that's where that infrastructure angle comes in. So just one more follow-up for you. What advice would you have for young people who want to get involved in, and actually both of you could probably take this, what advice would you have for young people who want to get involved in this environmental movement? Karen, why don't you go first and then Sarah? Oh, Sarah, go ahead. Um. Before we wrap up, I just want to say I'm so inspired by Karen. I, I, I watched a lot of your stuff before this interview. And it's it's young people like you that, that give me hope in uh, making a change. I, I have a, a Gen Z daughter, and um, I it breaks my heart uh, to, to see what she's uh, inherited. But then I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, and the, the whole Greta movement has been very inspiring. The Fridays for Future is, is just an incredible movement. These young people that get out there every week. There's a young woman in Uganda. Every Friday she goes and she speaks her mind. Uh, and it's, it's incredibly, incredible to see. So I would just say if th these, uh, these young people could, could keep it up and stay motivated and don't give up or get discouraged because the future really does rely on you and I, I, I hate to say that and I, I'm I'm sorry that it does and it rests on your shoulders. As a, as a Gen uh, Xer, I, I, we're here to help uh, and we're here to step aside where you come in with greater knowledge and greater energy. So I'm, I'm just so proud of you, Karin, and everybody else uh, involved in these movements right now. 
So Karen, how do you inspire younger people or what do you think, how do you think they can step up? I would think, I would say right now, we need to use what we have, what we know best, and that is social media and using social media as that medium to build the conversation, but also share accurate information and limit disinformation. I think we're at this stage where there is so much disinformation circulating that we first need to address what are the facts. And that's something that you have been very proactive about. And it's, it's great to see you know, peers from all over the world um, and do that. But I think that second stage is the hardest. And this is what truly differentiates youth being able to being the ones to solve the solution. Um, and that is actually going out into your local communities and finding ways in which you can make impact. So it's shifting away from couch activism, which is sharing your views and not doing anything about it, but more so than find even the smallest thing that you can do in your local community and, and start there. And then it doesn't only end there, but it also, you know, comes in your home environment and making sure that while you can, you know, educate your young, younger siblings about what's going on in the world, but it's also sharing that information with your parents and changing mindsets and, you know, within your own family, trying to have more sustainable habits that sort of shift that mindset and contribute to a more sustainable path. Karen, you tackled the oil spill, which was a memorable, enormous disaster in this country. You've looked at transportation issues in Africa. You've created a documentary. What is the next challenge you have your sights on? <laughs> I think the next step for me is to just, so the, the work that I'm currently doing in Africa is one that I'm very passionate about. And I think that is going to be a stepping stone for contributing, con continuing to, to work in, in that region. Specifically, we're starting off in Zambia and trying to disrupt the transportation sector and taking a sustainable angle towards it. But then I know there's a lot of other um, angles that we can take, such as financial literacy for the local community and helping build more sustainable energy solutions. And so I'm using that as a stepping stone, but um, yeah, we're, we're going to see where it goes from there. <laughs> so I want to finish with a question for each of you. Um, what problem do you think we are overlooking right now that's going to be a problem for a generation ahead? Where are you seeing the need to reinvest interest and young people's energy? Sarah, maybe you can start with that. I will. Uh, this might be a little bit more broad than what you're you're getting at, but uh, I'm I'm discouraged by the 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 lack of focus on um, corporate accountability, and uh, the, the portion of of climate issues that actually come from industry and agriculture. Uh, as consumers, we're told that it's up to us to limit our showers. Um, limit our plastics and recycle and compost. We're, but we're only about 10%. But we were water is concerned of the consumers of the fresh water on, on the planet. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, along with the, this next generation, we, we can force that awareness of corporate responsibility and hopefully force some change. Thank you. Karen, take it on yourself. Yeah, I could not agree more with, and with what Sarah just mentioned in that while we have the public sector that ultimately is the one to enforce. It's really what we see through the private sector and what corporations do that ultimately shape our opinions and show that progress is being made. That was the whole purpose of the Von Columbia documentary, where it was me connecting with a, um, an executive within a mining and ceramics company and sort of showing my perspective on what I believed him and his company needed to change to sort of have that youth tie-in and that belief that corporations are, are changing. Because while the government does do a lot, we really firsthand see what corporations do in our local communities. And so I, I would really hit on that point of it's where corporations and the messaging that they now pursue that are ultimately going to be the ones that re-energize youth. I can't resist asking you, are you optimistic looking ahead? Absolutely. I don't think you can take a, a pessimistic approach. I think even with everything that's going on right now, you need to, you know, the optimism is what carries you in, in your creativity and your, your continuous efforts in, in solving these solutions that don't have a definite solution and, are, and that are, you know, larger than, than you. And so I think that mindset always has to remain within youth because that's the only way that, that progress will then be made. And Sarah, you, are you optimistic? 
I, I will echo that. Yes, it, we're, we're, de we're devoting our lives to tackling these issues, so we, so we must remain optimistic. Um, so it is not forced optimi optimism. We, I, we really are, it's especially um, getting to see this next generation and the standard that they're taking. I, I, I have concerns, but overall, I am optimistic. Sarah Evans and Karen Jayruth, thank you both very much for joining me this morning on Washington Post Live. Thank you. We were delighted you. to have you both. That was a fascinating conversation. Thank you. If you'd like to watch highlights from this morning's video, please go to WashingtonPostLive.com, where you can also find a calendar of upcoming events. I'm Francis Steed Sellers, and thank you very much for joining us.